Well, good morning, everybody. It's really good to see you this morning. Um, some of you are here. Some of you are going to watch this later on the video. And we're going to begin as we sing Holy, 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 early in the morning, our songs will rise to thee. So let's stand while we sing. As we come to our prayers this morning, we're going to start us by reading some, verse, some words from Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let's pray. Father, we want this morning to sing joyfully to you. Lord, it is fitting for the upright to praise him. Lord, of ourselves, we cannot be upright. Lord, however hard we try, there are still times when we fail you. But Lord, you have made it possible for us to be righteous through Jesus Christ. We thank you this morning, Lord, for him. 
We thank you for all that he has, ac has accomplished on our behalf. Lord, we want to bring before you a new song, a song, Lord, of, of joy from our hearts. Lord, it might be words that we've sung many times before, but Lord, give us today a new understanding of those words, I pray. Help us to sing them with a new depth and a new love for you. Lord, there are so many things to praise you for and to be thankful for. Lord, for, for many of us that have this morning used the same Bible notes, it was all about, Lord, being thankful. And there, Lord, it told us to think of five things to be thankful for. Lord, as we think about that five things, we realise that the, the hymn writer said, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. Lord, the hymn writer said, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So we thank you, Lord, for every good thing that you've given to us. Let's just have a moment and you thank him quietly for whatever you want to this morning. Father, we wait in hope for you this morning that you might be our help and our shield, that our hearts might rejoice in you as we trust and praise your holy name. There is none beside you. Lord, may your unfailing love be with us, your people this morning, as we put our hope in you. Be with those, Lord, who would like to have been here but could not be, perhaps through illness or infirmity, whatever it might be, Lord. And we pray for those who did not want to be here this morning. Lord, bless them too. Give them a new desire, a new warmth in their hearts, Lord, to turn towards you. Lord, as we sing, as we pray, as we read your word, as we listen to you, as we share around your table this morning, Lord, we pray that we might be truly glad that we might know and taste and see that you are good. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's share in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. If you're able to stand, please stand with us as we sing two songs. Give thanks with a grateful heart and then he is exalted. So let's stand ready to sing.
He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. We're going to um, just pray for the younger ones if they're going out, go out, and then um, we are going to have um, also give thanks for the offering. So let's pray. Father, thank you that we can uh, pray for our younger ones this morning. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that you will help them. Uh, I pray that it'll be a valuable time uh, being here uh, for them. Pray for the older ones who go out with them too. Thank you, Lord, as well, that we've got an opportunity to give to our offering. Uh, Lord, it's, it's a pleasure. Your word talks about being cheerful givers. And Lord, we pray that we might have given cheerfully and from our hearts with love for you. Lord, accept these gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time to have our Bible reading. And this morning, John's going to bring that to us. And so I'll hand over to him. This morning reading is taken from John, chapter 21, verse 15 to the end. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger and dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your arms and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved were following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testified to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Lord, bless this word to our hearts. Amen. Thank you, John. I'm going to look at particularly one verse from that today, and uh, one maybe that uh, gets overlooked a little bit. Um, first of all, we, we, when we were praying, and we were thinking about people who need a hope, and there is a hope. And we're going to sing about it now. So if you like to stand, if you're able, let's stand while we sing There Is A Hope.
over the last uh, few weeks, our subject that we've been looking at, our theme, if you like, has moved. We started on um, distractions on the road to the cross. And then we moved on last week to distractions on the road from the cross. And uh, the one we're going to look at today is probably the final one that we're going to look at. And although I, look, I thought that last week, actually, I thought this was going to be the last one in this theme. And then God said, no, it's not. I wonder if you've ever compared yourself with someone else. Ever compared yourself with someone else? Or what you've got with someone else? It can happen in lots of ways. We're going to look at them soon. We've, we've got a, a phrase that we use in our language, keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, you've heard that, keeping up with the Joneses. Now, the origin of that is not very clear, but it was made popular by a newspaper cartoon of the same name uh, in America. It depicted the social climbing McGin McGuinness family who always struggled to keep up with their neighbours who were the Joneses. And that's what it was all about. Um, that wasn't the origin, but that made it popular. I'm sorry if your name is Jones, by the way. Uh, I don't think there is anybody here, but there might be somebody watching on the video. But they based their lives on another family. They based their lives on another family. Uh, and I, I saw a cartoon about keeping up with the Joneses, and uh, it wasn't that one, but uh, the person on, the, on it said to his family, I've got some news for you. We have overtaken the Joneses. Now to keep up with the Smiths. <laughs> Why did people tend to compare themselves with those who've got more than with those that have got less? Whatever form that might take. Well, we picked up uh, the Bible passage uh, this morning in John chapter 21 at verse 15. If we'd have looked at the first um, the first 14 verses, we would have seen there that that is when Jesus appears to his disciples by the side of the lake. Peter and some of the others go fishing. Uh, they've not caught anything all night. Uh, they see somebody on the side of the shore and he says, throw your net on the other side and um, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And then they catch so many that they can't pull them all in. And then John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter hears him say that, he jumps into the water and goes to Jesus. And the others follow in the boat. And we have the time when Jesus has got some fish prepared for them. And um, they, it's that bit, as soon as they saw the Lord, they knew it was the Lord. The third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples. And then we, then we find in the first bit that, that John read to us that Peter was reinstated. If you like, he had a second chance. He'd, been, he'd denied Jesus three times. And it seemed that he probably not had a chance to put that right. But Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Three times, Peter says he did. And then he said, you know I love you. And Jesus gives him new work to do. Feed my lambs and take care of my sheep. And we remember that when uh, Peter was called and when, um, not at the time he was called, but after he'd been called and when he was following Jesus, Jesus said to him, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. You are Peter, on this rock you will build my church. But of course we know that Peter had a bit of a roller coaster uh, ride as a life as a disciple. And uh, after, although Jesus said that to him, must have been a, an amazing time for him that Jesus also said these words to him in John 13. After uh, Jesus said he was going to go away, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really lay your life down for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And so we know that he did disown Jesus, but he's now being reinstated. 
And so do we find then that it's all in the past? It's all in the past. He doesn't have to worry anymore that he said, I will lay down my life for you. He doesn't have to worry about that. Well, actually, Jesus does give him new work to do. But then he comes up with these words. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter had said, I am willing to lay down my life for you. And Pete, Jesus kind of now says, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Not only that, but he brings out even the, the method that it will happen in crucifixion. Someone will stretch out your arms. That's what Jesus is saying. And uh, the early church tr tradition and writers say that Peter was martyred by crucifixion, but he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. And Jesus has restored his place. Follow me. Goes right back to when Peter was called. He's made clear the work that he's to do. Feed my sheep. Goes back to, on this rock, I will build my church. But he's also warned him of what the future holds. And all that is followed by, you follow me. Poignant words for Peter, because they were the first ones, those amongst the first ones that he heard Jesus say to him. As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And now he comes back to that. All that you've been through, Peter, and all you're going to go through, follow me. And it seems that as they are walking along, Peter looks round and he sees John following him. And he says, Lord, what about him? After all that Jesus has said is going to happen to Peter, what about him? So that's the first thing. We don't really know what the motive was for that question. Some say it might have been compassion because he's hoping that John isn't going to face the same kind of death. Some say he was inquisitive. Tasker said he was idly curious. I like that little phrase. Some say he was saying, why me and not him? Why should I have to suffer more than he does? Let me read to you from Luke and 22, just um, a few verses. Luke 22, and beginning at verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. I wanted to read that to put it in context because we're going to share around the Lord's table. And so all that, Jesus said, this is what's going to happen. And what did the disciples do? A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. Benefactors, But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. I think they're connected. It's not me who's going to betray. Or is it because they think they're the greatest? But we don't see, you see, why Peter asked that question. Why did he say, what about him? Well, what's more important, actually, than the question is how Jesus answered. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. 
Now, some, some said uh, there was a rumour around that jo John wasn't going to die because of what Jesus said. And, and I think John wrote this, that bit in and he said he was putting it right. Jesus didn't say that he wasn't going to die. He just said, what if I want him to? What has that got to do with you? Basically, what about him? It's none of your business. Basically, that's it. Concentrate on yourself and you follow me. And they go in different directions. If you look in the books of Acts, book of Acts, Peter seems much more prominent in the early church. John seems to have set up his heart on testifying about and witnessing for Jesus. Uh, and John writes uh, those letters that we've got there. And I think we can see uh, what John wanted to do. He said in his first letter, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify, it to, testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. You see, they went in different ways. They did different things. And just as a side issue, and I think I need to bring this up, but it's important. When Jesus effectively says, concentrate on yourself and don't worry about others, he is not saying we should not care for others. He is not saying that. That will go against the teaching of the Bible totally. Paul wrote in Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. See, it's not, this, it's not saying that. It's not saying don't care for others. When Jesus said it's none of your business about him. I just wanted to mention that because I think that's quite important. So the first thing was, what about him? But I think we need to look at it in a another way. What about, and you can put anybody in there, anybody yourself in there. So if we're honest, it's hard for us not compa to, to compare ourselves with others. It's hard for people not to do that, if we're honest. And so let's have a look at how it might happen. People see others getting away with things and they would say, that's not fair. What you're actually doing is comparing, you're saying, this is how I'm being treated, that's how they're being treated. Or others are acting in the wrong, so we see ourselves favourably when they're acting in the wrong. So let me give you an example. I'm driving right on the limit, uh, 70, and sometimes it's just getting a little bit over. And what do I sometimes think? Oh, but look at them, look how fast they're going. I'm all right, look how fast they're going. I'm actually comparing myself with them. Or this seem to get preferential treatment. Or at work, the promotion we think we ought to have had, somebody else gets. We maybe can look at other people and think, oh, they're not as conscientious. Or I always seem to be the one to do the work. Or I'm not appreciated. Someone else does something and everybody thanks them. Or there are things uh, as individuals. We can look at sometimes, they're more gifted than I am. They've got more skills than I have. They've got a more attractive personality. Why does everybody laugh at their jokes but nobody laughs at mine? Maybe because it's not, they're not very funny, but... We can think like that, can't we? Or the way that they seem to be blessed by God, or their health, or their looks. You know, it's a massive thing for younger people with this pressure to conform. A massive thing is pressure to conform. And then there's a whole area of possessions. But this comparing as well can happen between churches. Why have that church got better equipment? Why do they, are they seemingly more successful? 
we've got this and that. Somebody, you know, somebody said to me, oh, we've got four worship bands and we can take it in turns and we don't have to do it every week. Or we look at it and they think about their preaching or the size of it or the facilities in the building. You know, a couple of weeks ago we were at Anne's auntie's funeral down in Surrey and we had the afternoon after refreshments at a church hall and it was an amazing place. It wasn't built long ago, uh, less than 10 years ago and they've got everything in there and I thought, wow, we've got, in our hall, we've got lights that come on in the toilets when you go in. They've got lights that alter according to the season. I thought, oh, that's great. And another thing they had, some of us, when we put the tables down, struggled to get them down. They got this special tool that you use to put the tables down. We might laugh, but it can happen, can't it? And ministers aren't immune from this. In fact, we can be more tempted. The number of job adverts I've seen, and, and, and I've seen these, these job adverts and and they say, we can offer a hundred children every week, and we can offer this, and we can offer that, and we've got this kind of worship band, and we've got four services every year, every, day, every, every week. Or comments about others. Oh, this preacher is really good. Andy preaches without notes. It's hard not to compare. If only I was Billy Graham. If only I'd got this person's voice or this person's knowledge. I remember being at our union conference once and we'd had a brilliant speaker, a fantastic speaker, and next was me. And I thought, how can I follow that? Really, because I was comparing myself. But do you know, we tend to compare with those who are better or more or appear more successful. It happens. Why is it important that we don't do it? Well, we need to ask, what can it lead to? It leads to envy, doesn't it? It leads to jealousy. It can lead to strife. It can lead to covetousness. I wish that was mine. It can lead to resentment and more. I think that sometimes this can affect us. Please don't think I sit there at home all the time thinking, oh, They've got much better than us. No, I'm not talking about that. But it's hard when somebody says to you, oh, look what we've got here. It's hard not to compare sometimes. But the, first, the third thing is this one. What about me? What about me? Because the words of the Lord Jesus are so apt. You follow me. You follow me. I, I, I think I've told you before, I, somebody was asked, um, asking about a, a big church and they said, we're in a small church and we're struggling along and we see these big churches and they're doing all these fantastic things. What do you suggest we do? And the person said, forget about them and get on with your work. Do you realise what Peter had actually done? He turned and looked at John. In a sense, he'd taken his eyes off Jesus. They were walking along together, his eyes on Jesus, talking, and he turns and he sees John. Remember when Peter was walking on the water? Jesus came out to him and he said, if you, and Peter said, if it is you, tell me to walk on the water. And Peter got out the boat. And what do we read? When he saw the wind, in other words, when he saw the effect of the wind, he began to sink. What had he done? He'd taken his eyes off Jesus. That's what he'd done and saw what was happening. If Peter, again here, he'd taken his eyes off Jesus, he said, follow me, and said, what about him? Because to follow someone, you need to keep your eyes on them, don't you? You need to keep your eyes on them. I don't know if you've ever been following someone in a car. So somebody in a car, especially if you're going somewhere in a big city and uh, 
it might, it might happen, for instance, you've been to a funeral service and you've got to get somewhere else and somebody will say, oh, you follow me. Oh, it's so hard, isn't it? You follow so close, don't you? You do it intensely, don't you? You keep your eyes on them. Almost too much sometimes. Because when the traffic lights change, you go through, don't you, to keep up with them. In following Jesus, we need to keep our eyes on him. And we also need to remember that God will not judge us on what others do or what others don't do. We will be judged on what God is calling us to do. That's what we're going to be judged on. I don't believe that when I face a judgment before God, that time I'm with him. I don't think he's going to turn around to me and say, you know, Phil, Graham Kendrick wrote, wrote brilliant songs and you haven't written any. Or Billy Graham preached to millions. How many have you preached to? Or Warren Wiersbe wrote 276 books. How about that? How many have you written? See, there's no league tables for churches. There's no league tables that you've got to get higher than that church. Or as ministers that you've got to do that. Did you do what I called you to do? I think that's going to be the question. Did you do what I called you to do? See, we've got a mission statement there. It's great. Seeking to love God, each other, and the wider community. And it's the same for all of us. That every one of us will try to fulfill it in a different way. We'll try, none of us are going to do it the same way. And we're not expected to. Some things will uh, cross over. Of course they will. There's an old song, isn't there? Jesus bids us shine with a pure, clear light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, we must shine where? You in your small corner and I in mine. And it's kind of saying the same thing. You're where you are, where I've put you, you're to shine there. Forget that person. Forget what they're doing. We need to be faithful where God has placed us and that's all he asks. One thing that I, I quite enjoy doing, and it's a bit strange as you might think, during the lockdown when we used to have a, we, we, you could have an hour's walk, they said, didn't they? No, nobody ever said that actually, they, they just said go out once a, a, a day. And one thing, an hour's walk used to get us up to the cemetery. And I quite liked walking around the cemetery and looking at the gravestones. And reading the gravestones, many of the older ones have six words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what they are? Well done. Good and faithful servant. No end of them have that, that kind of thing on it. Sadly, they don't now. Well done. Good and faithful servant. It doesn't say, well done, good and successful servant. It doesn't say, well done, good and successful servant who built seven churches. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. And the distraction for today is clear to see. It's comparing ourselves with others and taking our eyes off Jesus. I found this quote to finish with. It's not one of Jesus, not one that you're going to find in the scriptures. Don't try to be someone else or envy who or what they are. Instead, be the best you you can be as you follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we perhaps don't very often look at those words. What about him? But Lord, you said, don't worry about him. You follow me. Keep your eyes on me. Lord, I, I pray that you'll forgive me and anybody else who sometimes has perhaps wandered into looking at others may help us to fix our eyes upon you for lord you will say to us did you do what i called you to do you don't expect us to have written books like others or written songs like others or preached like other people did you just want us to be us in the place that you have called us 
Lord, may we keep our eyes fixed only upon you. May we hear those words again. You follow me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is the day we celebrate around the Lord's table. Uh, we're going to sing uh, an older hymn um, as an introduction. We're going to sing, There is a fountain filled with blood. It might be to a tune that you're not so familiar with or not familiar at all. Um, so let's stand as we sing.
as we come to the Lord's table, the invitation to all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Please join with us as we eat and drink together. Let me read to you um, these verses um, from Luke chapter 22. Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question themselves which of them it might be who would do this. And a dispute arose among them as to which was considered to be greatest. Do you see what they did? They took their eyes off Jesus, didn't they, and started looking at each other. But let's fix our eyes on him as we come to eat and drink together. When Paul wrote, he said, we should examine ourselves before we eat and drink. So let's just have a moment of quiet. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And Father, thank you that that can be the experience of every one of us, that our sins washed away, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so now as we eat this bread, as we remember his body broken for us, and as we drink the wine, as we remember his blood shed for us, may we keep our eyes fixed upon him. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took some bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread and eat it as we receive it. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. So let's keep the cup and then we'll drink it together. This cup represents the blood of Christ which was shed for us. Let us drink and be thankful. Father, all we can say is thank you. Thank you with every part of our lives for all that you did for us. Lord, we look forward to that time when we shall drink with you in the kingdom of God forever. But until that day, use us, Lord, wherever you place us, in Jesus' name. Amen. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Saviour, has ransomed me. Let's stand and let's sing Amazing Grace to close.
please take your seat. That song that Anne was playing during communion, these words, great words to go out with. All of me, not a part, but all of me, all the heart and soul of me, Jesus, I surrender. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. On the altar now I lay all I am today. Use me, Lord. Use me anywhere at all. Though my place be look great or small, let me fill it gladly. Take my life, be it poor or be it grand. Let me live it by your plan. Shape it with your hand. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both this day and forevermore. Amen.